Uh, this is my uh, pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Terry Anika, she's the director of the automotive company at QAD. As director of the automotive at QAD, Terry is responsible for global marketing activities, which includes strategy and positioning her product and offering people and knowledge and field and sales marketing support for the automotive uh, vertical. Terry works in close concert with customers to drive best practices and on trip for supplier status. She also is an industry leader in the development and global adoption of supply chain industry standards and best practices. Prior to joining QAD, Terry worked at GM, Ford, and Johnson Controls. She has been immersed in the automotive supply chain and technology space throughout the, her 30-year career. <laughs> Currently, Terry is an active member of the Automotive Industry Action Group, which is AIAG, Supply Chain Steering Committee. Terry is one of the authors of the Global Material Management Operations Guideline and Logistics Evaluation, which is used by thousands of automotive suppliers globally. Current uh, right now. She has been awarded several times by AIAG and audit for driving the development of global supply chain standards in the areas of assessment, key performance indicators, supplier agreements, and EDI. Uh, additionally, she has been awarded for her global work in supply chain in 2005. She received Practitioner Pro to know by supply and demand chain executive. In 2018, bronze TV winner by Stevie Award for Women in Business. In <coughs> 2018, Notable Women in Technology by Crens Detroit of Business. So she's also our uh, graduate from Bachelor's of Science degree in Computer Information System and she graduated in 1990. Let's give her, say, give her a big hand and welcome her to our campus today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be back here. I was telling them when I, I have flashbacks of this room, it used to be my economy class. So when I walked in, I'm like, oh, that's what it was. So such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, is really uh, the automotive industry and some of the challenges that are going on in the industry and really how we can apply technology to solve these issues that we have in automotive to really, we all want a cheaper car, right? We don't want to spend a lot of money for our cars. So that means that the automotive suppliers have to really always keep their costs down, right? And in order to do that, one of the key ways they do that is to really be able to manage their supply chain efficiently. So I'm going to talk about this in a standard that I helped to uh, co-author in the automotive community. And then also talk about advanced technology like machine learning and data lakes, all this new uh, technology that's out there to help us solve, solve business problems. But before I get started, just a little bit of background on myself. I know Shorty introduced me, but I think the most key thing is I'm an LTU graduate on uh, 1990. I hope I give you all inspiration. It took me 10 years to get my, my bachelor's. So uh, I went started at Macomb Community College. I got my associates, and that was at the end when an associates really wasn't meaning very much. I went to Oakland University for a semester. I just didn't like it. And then my brother-in-law, well, he's not my brother-in-law. It was my sister's boyfriend at the time. He was going to Lawrence Tech, and he liked it. He talked my sister Kim to go to Lawrence Tech. I thought, they said, you ought to try it. So I came here, and I really enjoyed it. And I got my, uh, my option was in um, com computer information systems. So I hope I give you hope. Sometimes life seems like it's a real struggle. You might have multiple jobs, lots going on in your plate, but you can get through it. Another thing I want to share with you is back when I was in college, talking in front of a classroom would be the last thing I want to do. <laughs> and you know, another thing I can tell you to really force yourself to grow in my job, because I was involved with industry standards, I had to start speaking in front of, of audiences. And I remember I would be rehearsing and practicing, and I was a wreck. But today, you can really fight through it. So I hope I bring that message to you today. Life, you can get through it. Just put the passion behind it, and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to do that. So very excited to be here today. Again, have a lot of extensive background in uh, supply chain. Another thing I wanted to mention, too, just to give a, 
a promotion to supply chain and information technology. I know a lot of the young millennials and the new people really want to be able to travel the world, right? When I started my job at QAD 17 years ago, I had never left North America. Today I've been to 32 countries. Because the auto industry is so global, and my job best practices, I need to teach it everywhere. So it's a great thing to keep in mind with the advanced technologies that are out there, the global, the opportunity to travel and see the world is really amazing. So I encourage you to think about that as well too. We need more supply chain people. Uh, just real quickly about my company, we provide ERP software. So you, you uh, automotive suppliers that provide like a steering wheel or an airbag or a, a seat, use our software to manage their whole company. So they have, we have finances, purchasing, supply chain. It's a full ERP <coughs> system. So uh, we're very global, uh, and we've been around for uh, since 1979. I graduated in 1980, so actually a year before um, I graduated from high school, I actually QAD was uh, started. So great, own, our owners are wonderful people. Another great story, uh, you know, typical American dream too. They were um, our one owner. He was his feet were really big, so he had a hard time with shoes. So he decided to start making his own, and he got so good at it. Today, the business is now Hoka, or um, Uggs. And so Pam, which is his wife, the co-owner, said, well, I need to develop software for you to do that manufacturing. And so that's why today uh, they've been very successful. And that's one other thing I want to mention. In the verticals that we support, I'm responsible for automotive. But in the verticals we support, it's all manufacturers. That's all we support. We don't do any other kind of business at QAD. And just to again, give you an idea, again, this is the Chevy Bolt. Uh, Bolt. It's both an electric vehicle and an autonomous vehicle for General Motors. And all these companies that you see around it are our customers. So we are very strongly focused on the automotive, we call them tier ones, because they, they provide parts directly into the OEMs like Ford, Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler. So, you know, wiring harnesses, uh, power trains, all kinds of things, brakes, and a lot of what you see around here is kind of scary because it's going to be going away soon with the autonomous vehicle. I was with a cust uh, prospect yesterday and I saw he had, they made horns and I was thinking, you know, in another 10 years we may not need horns, right? If everything's autonomous, they should be riding off of each other. They're not going to be beeping at each other, I don't think, <laughs> when you don't have a driver. So, uh, so that's just a little bit of background about my company so you know where, I, where I'm coming from. So in automotive, it's all about quality, cost, and delivery. I've been in the automotive industry the, my whole career. It's all about that. That's always the focus. How do we get, get the best quality? Because we don't want poor running cars. How do I give them to the customers at the best cost? And how do I make sure that we deliver those parts on time? Right? We got to make sure that the parts get to the assembly plant at the right time so that you get your order from the dealership when you want to have it. So very, very important. And we're living in a lot of uncertainty. Akio Toyota said we're in an era where the era where the only answers are really unknown. We don't know. Mary Barra from General Motors said we're going to see more change in the next five years than we have in the last 50. So we are on full-fledged, moving fast right now in the automotive industry. And on top of that, we have all these things going on with technology out there. It is really mind-boggling change, uh, 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 change that we see right now of all the different things, Internet of Things, 3D printing. I had a VP of BMW show me some printed parts that are actually going into a production vehicle. You would never hear of that even five years ago. So we are really going through a lot of change with technology, and it's, it's pretty exciting and kind of scary. The other thing that's going on right now with the auto industry is we're under major transformation because we're going from this combustion engine to an electric vehicle into autonomous vehicles. And uh, uh, Paul Eichenberg, he does a lot of guest blogs. So if you go to qad.com slash uh, blogs, uh, Paul Eichenberg, he does a lot of really good articles about what this means to the automotive industry and that you really need to be prepared for what's ahead of, uh, what's ahead of you in the future. And it's kind of scary because I go work with some smaller suppliers and they are not thinking electric vehicle, autonomous vehicle. They are still focused on this combustion engine, which we know will go away. So I can see that there could be some potential disruption if everybody doesn't really catch on to where the industry is really headed. And then at, uh, in the industry, I actually teach a supply chain class uh, where a lot of tier one suppliers come to the class. 
And now, you know, I'm a runner, I love running. You know, when I think of Garmin, I think, well, I have a Fitbit, but I think of a fitness watch, right? So I'm teaching classes and now Garmin is coming to my supply chain class. So we see brand new entrants and there are more and more technology going into the vehicle. So it's really, really, really exciting. So what's really driving the industry? So this is a big deal right here, is this volatile demand. If you talk to anybody in the automotive industry, it's always like, oh, you know, can they ever predict how many cars we're gonna make, right? Oh, it's always off, it's too much, it's too little. But really what drives that volatile demand is us as consumers. So years ago, SUVs weren't popular. Now everywhere you go, SUVs are popular in every country. I was driving with my colleague in Shanghai and she was like, I want an SUV. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'm not used to hearing them talk about it everywhere. So we start to shift what we'd like to have. So that causes all the demand to change in the industry. How fast or slow all this electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle is gonna come in, we're really not sure, we've got guesses. So all of this drives automotive companies crazy because trying to predict what I'm gonna build to keep my inventory right, to keep my costs low is really important. The supply chains are longer than ever, and I'm a, I can tell you, I've been to 32 countries. They're all over the world, you know? They're very long. You've, I, Russia, uh, there's supply chains, and China, Indonesia, you know, just every place you can think about um, has automotive production of some shape or form. So really, how do we manage these long supply chains globally? And again, deliver products on time. Achieving industry compliance, you know, all automotive suppliers, if I'm making a steering wheel or a brake, you gotta become a preferred supplier to a Ford or a Chrysler or General Motors. You gotta really show them that I've got good delivery capabilities, I can meet good quality standards, um, I can meet cyber, I don't have any cybersecurity issues. This list goes on forever of what they demand of you as a supplier. And so if the automakers themselves don't have a lot of expectations, now we have a lot of government compliance. So, you know, corporate responsibility, um, conflict minerals, uh, all kinds of financial things that they have to deal with. And then the last column here is really how do you have good, consistent global processes? So, for instance, Yang Fang, which used to be, I used to work at Johnson Controls, and now part of it is Yang Fang. It's bought, been bought by the Chinese. So, they have over 100 manufacturing facilities all over the world that support production, car production. So 100. We've got Lear that has 200 sites around the world. So lots of automotive production. But what these suppliers really want to have is they want to have good global processes. They want to have systems that run out of the box to best practices because my customer is breathing down my back that I have to be really good at what I do. They always are trying to improve their performance, right? We've got to keep our quality, cost, delivery. We need to keep that in line. And then today what they're dealing with is Industry 4.0 or these advanced technologies like machine learning, artificial intelligence, data lakes. So not only do I have to manage all this, but now I've got all this new technology coming in. How am I going to manage that in my manufacturing facility to take advantage of that? And a lot of what we're doing here with Industry 4.0 is actually to help with skills gaps. Because a lot of people, <coughs> millennials, aren't interested in manufacturing anymore. So if we can't replace those at the manufacturing facilities, then maybe we need to do more projects with Industry 4.0 to, to leverage intelligence to try to do some of that job that maybe we don't have the skills to do anymore. So all of that really adds up to risk, right? You can see that an automotive supplier has so much risk facing them. So how do we help them to manage that? Well, through the industry, AIAG, and actually I'd encourage, it's just across the street. It's called the Automotive Industry Action Group. It's literally right across the highway there. And they manage all the standards for North America and Asia Pacific. And then Odette manages all the standards in Europe. So oftentimes these two will come together and they'll create a global standard so that if I have a standard on how to be best practice in supply chain, it's not just for me and my in North America, but I can apply that wherever I have facilities in the world because the auto industry is so global anymore. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a document called MMOGLE. It stands for the Materials Management um, Operations Guideline Logistics Evaluation, and this really is a focus to help you really improve your delivery or your supply chain in your manufacturing facility. 
Uh, it is actually now, just recently, it used to be in an Excel spreadsheet, but it's with the modern times now. It just got put on the cloud. So uh, there's thousands of suppliers all over the world. I mean, there's probably 10,000 suppliers that have to fill out this assessment that we put together. And now they do that online. They kind of go through each best practice and they tell their customer, I have that capability or I don't. Once they get done, then it'll tell them whether you're a world-class supplier or you have a lot of deficiencies. So uh, it started out in actually 2001, and it's currently was just released in its fifth revision. So I was thinking the other day, I'm like, wow, it's not far away from being around the industry for 20 years. But it continues to get updated because it helps suppliers so much with their facilities. So it was developed through the two standards organization, and I've been a member of the author group for uh, many years, I think since version two. And again, you complete it at the manufacturing level. So if I'm a next tier, they make steering wheels. I would complete the MMO GLE assessment for that one site. Now next tier has probably 60 sites around the world, so every site would have to complete that. Because every site runs differently, has different management. So um, they would have to complete that. And then again, once they're done, it scores you and tells you just how good they are. Now, obviously, all OEMs want A suppliers. They don't want a C supplier, right? Nobody wants that disruptive supplier. So if you score a level C, your OEM's going to be saying, OK, we got to work together. We got to get that score up to a level A. <coughs> this is actually what it covers within the supply chain. So um, are the students familiar with EDI? OK, good. So they start out getting that EDI, those forecasts and the shipping requirements. Then I, I get those, what my demand and my shipping schedule is going to be. Now i got to plan on how I'm going to support that, right? So I may need to order from my sub-suppliers. And then from the suppliers then will ship, and that obviously goes into inventory. I also need to schedule out to my floor what parts I'm going to produce today. And then eventually I ship that off to, to my customer, OK? So very important. Very important in today's age, too, is contingency plans. So if something goes wrong, if my suppliers can't ship me, if I can't ship my customers, if I don't have enough resources to build the part, what am I going to do? Because if you shut an assembly plant down, so if I'm an, a Yang Fang and I shut GM down for one minute, they charge me $27,000. Every minute that ticks that you stop an assembly line is $27,000. That's the average going rate. Yes? What, what's the difference between EDI uh -huh. and ERP. EDI is a way that a customer will communicate with a supplier. So if I'm if I'm GM I, and you're Yang Fang, I'll send you uh, a, a schedule today, and it'll tell you I want 100 pieces today. I want 200 pieces tomorrow. They do interior, so maybe I want 100 seat sets today, 200 seat sets tomorrow. It gives you that schedule. ERP then takes that feed. ERP manages all of this. It manages the whole. Everything in here would be a portion of ERP. And that's what Q is, that's what your company yes. is. Yes. Yeah. So is your company, is there actually an office or is it all just cloud based and it's just uh, we offer our corporate is in uh, Santa Barbara, California, and we have an office here because of because of the automotive industry in Farmington Hills. And we've got I think twenty seven offices all over the world. But all over the globe. You do then is the whole software, the ERP. So my role at my company is is I look at what's going on in the automotive industry, and I make sure our software can meet what's what's going to be happening. So I see that machine learning is taking off. So I'm starting to help our R&D to, de to develop machine learning applications that fulfill a use case that will help our customers to be better. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm also listening through the industry what the requirements are going to be from them as well, and here what the OEMs are going to re be requiring. Does that help? It's hard for QAD to break into the business. How did you become so successful like this? Uh, I think, um, yeah, because SAP is our big competitor. I'll be quite honest. They're a very big competitor of ours. I think with us, what we've done is we've only focused on manufacturing. Where you've, SAP does everything, right? So QED is just stuck to manufacturers in, in, in that area. And I think we, being here also in the auto industry, really being at the heartbeat of it and understanding what they need has helped us to really develop great software too. I would say that's the success. Yes. Good questions. And up at the top are the chapters, and we'll talk about those a little bit later on. 
A couple things that I want to mention. Um, this assessment does have 182 requirements. There's a full, which is 187, and the basic is just half of that. And that's used with the lower tier. So you got a tier one, and sometimes supply chain tiers to the OEM can be six le levels deep, right? So they can be very long. Uh, so the basics used down the supply chain. The key thing here that's important is there's these F3 questions. And if you just miss one, you could get 186 right, and you miss just one, you automatically go to a C-level supplier. Why is that? Because if you're missing that one practice, best practice, we know you've got cracks in your foundation. It's just like a house. Um, it's been translated into 11 languages. And those F3 questions are really centered around everything needs to be automated anymore. If we use Excel spreadsheets, we know things are going to break. You can't communicate a spreadsheet quick enough around an organization. And so it really does focus on using ERP, the EDI, barcoding, um, even the quality processes, making sure everything's fully integrated and automated so everybody can re respond quickly. Yes? Fascinating. How do you uh, verify that the responses are true? Because it, is it a written mm -hmm. response, or how do you verify? This, the OEMs will come out and, and audit you. The customer comes out and checks it. Yes. Yes. And that's one of the things that we do at QAD, too, is we kind of help so before the OEM comes out, we go in there and we tell you, hey, this is, this, based on our knowledge of this, we know this will fail. So we kind of help them before they get there, if they need it. Some, some. Is that what Boeing did wrong when they didn't have? <laughs> yes, some yes. Sort of validity follow up, I guess. So yeah, the OEMs will definitely go out and take a look at it. And that listing, is it published? Is it available to public? Yes, you can go on the AIAG website, AIAG.org. So you know who's A, who's B, who's C. Oh, oh, oh no, no, the, only the OEM knows that or the supplier knows that. Yes, they, they, right now they don't share that with each other. No, yeah. But that, they really would like to go there. <laughs> but as far as I know, I'm not going to share, yes. Is that like, um, you know, in universities, the grades are confidential. Uh -huh. If I'm applying for a job and I ask my university to send the grades. Same thing when GM, I want to be a supplier for GM, mm -hmm. then I've gone through this process and I ask that two Absolutely. parties, please send me my, my scores to GM. Right. That's when he gets A, B, or C. Absolutely. A great example is Ford is the most toughest on an MMO GLE assessment. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a supplier, you see Q1. A Q1 means that's the top level certification you can get for Ford. That means that you're, you're going to keep getting business at that plant from Ford. Um, they, so when people get that Q1, this is a part of having to get Q1 is to go through this audit. So they'll say, look, it, I got my Q1 flag. I passed this with Ford. And they'll use that as a selling point to get business. <coughs> yes. But they'll, they'll do that. But obviously, if they didn't do good, they wouldn't probably want to say anything <laughs> until they get that score up. So again, the full assessment is used between the OEM, which is again Ford, Chrysler, GM, and the Tier 1, and the basic is used down the supply chain. But the interesting thing today with technology is all those technology points, it doesn't matter if you're a large multinational Tier 1 supplier or a little Tier 2 or 3, you're expected to have automation within your organization. So no manual processes, because manual processes are just known to break and be slow. And then the other thing we've done with MMO GLE, the, the equivalent on the quality side is IATF 16949. So we've really made sure those work together. So for instance, in automotive, there's a term called the corrective action. That means, OK, I, I'm GM, and Lisa just did something bad. So I issue her a corrective action, and I tell her, you need to fix this, and you need to tell me how you're going to fix it and make sure it never comes back again. So those corrective actions could be towards supply chain people, or it could be towards a quality issue. So there's a lot of overlap in some places between. And so we made sure that we minimize the duplication, but we want to still make sure the thought's not missing, that you look at it with both hats on. These are the OEMs that use it uh, around the world. Here's a list here of some of them. In the middle, these are some of the tier ones. There's a lot of tier ones that use it with tier two. Uh, the interesting thing here, I've been to Korea and also in Mexico, where they really want to make sure that they keep their automotive base strong, so they actually subsidize training in those countries for MMO GLE. And then we've got some OEMs looking to do it here. Um, I'm actually going to be going to China the week of April 6th, and I'm going to meet with NEO. They were on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago. They're a brand new electric vehicle supplier. 
and they want to roll out MMO GLE with their supply base. So, um, so very interesting. It continues to grow. And it really does bottom line help your supply base. Uh, this was a tier one supplier. They actually make the windshield uh, on your car. And uh, they were struggling with Ford. They had lost their Q1, so they had lost their ability to get new business. And so we went in there with the MMO GLE and we really looked at their processes and what we saw, they had a lack of work instructions, a lot of new people, nobody really knew what to do. So lots of skills gaps, lots of spreadsheets, which are uh, just a bad word um, um, in managing supply chain. Uh, they were using purchase orders of, instead of what we call a schedule order. A schedule order is, is just, it takes, you know, I'm gonna be needing this many amount of pieces over the next two weeks. So instead of saying a PO every day, I want this much today and tomorrow, if you do a schedule order, it's, it consolidates it much quicker. Mm -hmm. And you said they lost the Ford Q1, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means that these practices in the past, they mm -hmm. were able to get Q1? They got it and then they lost it. And so that's why the OEMs require them to update this every year because I could do something five years ago, but it was just today I was updating, a, I, I do, I'm on a faculty for a, a supply chain certificate at, with Wayne State and AIG, and I'm, just a year ago I had to update all my presentation, right? It's so changed, and so what happens is they, if you don't keep up with it and do the annual assessment, take it seriously, then you're gonna get back into trouble again. So that can happen. Some suppliers may say, you know, I'm not gonna really update it this year. I'll just submit my score again. Because the only way you get caught is when you start to be a poor performer or you go to get new business. Because, for instance, like uh, GM has 3,000 suppliers, so they can't get out to audit everybody, but maybe they can do 300 a year. And those are typically new suppliers or poor performing suppliers. So everybody else may could ride the tide until they get caught. Can, so. can you go back to the slide before? Mm -hmm. This one? And if uh, OEM using, for instance, Jaguar. Land mm -hmm. Rover. Yep, they use they What does that line mean? So this means that they require you to complete the MMO GLE assessment with your, if you're a supplier to them. So if I'm next here and I make parts that go to uh, Jaguar Land Rover over in the UK, I have to complete the MMO GLE assessment. So these are all people that require it of their suppliers. So these are OEMs, but then you see the tier ones are now pushing it down to tier two. Does that make sense? Yes, this Jack one and Land Rover, they, they have enormous problem with quality. Yes. See, that, that's... Yeah, they're having a lot of issues over there in many different ways, correct. So is that, a, so this software can help the management or the people in, in Jaguar and Land Rover that are... <coughs> this would help their suppliers. So to be quite honest, with having Jaguar Land Rover, they're struggling so much to just get that going that they haven't had a time to do assessments. So I think it's like a, a double-edged sword there, right? Because they can't, they're having trouble. Now, now that everything's kind of slowed down there, they may have time to go out and, and, and to be able to do that. But they were, they were struggling initially because they were really ramping up. And so they had to kind of get away from doing assessments to focus on just getting the plant going. So that's why... Um, they've been having some issues. Yeah, Chrysler has improved drastically. Mm -hmm. My son works for Fiat yeah. Chrysler. I drive uh, the charity, but it used to be number 31 on the list. Now it has gone to number 16 in terms of quality. Oh, okay. So still, you know, ranked very, very low. Mm -hmm. So is Why? it because of the supply? This is, this is uh, it could be. Sometimes supplier argues it's the OEM, that they're changing, making too many changes. Right. It, it's hard to tell. It could be either or. I hear both sides pointing at each other. <laughs> so I, sometimes you're not 100% sure, but it could be either way. Either way. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Um, but one thing I did want to mention is that once we went in there and we made sure they were meeting each of the best practices of MMO GLE, um, just with one inventory, they were spending a million dollars. They got that down to 400K. So it helped them to reduce 60%. So imagine you, your bottom line by just going through this assessment, you reduce 600K of inventory, their inventory accuracy went up, and then just this management of communicating with their suppliers got much more efficient and much more faster. And when you fill out an MMO GLE assessment, it really does take every direct report um, from uh, the plant manager 
to complete that. So it's really a team effort. There's questions that would apply to every single one. And actually, this, this supplier here is in the Honduras. Who would think there's suppliers in the Honduras? I was, this is my colleague here from France, but it's just sometimes it's amazing where suppliers are located in the world. What do they make? Um, they, uh, they do electric chips. Mm -hmm. So in the chapters of MMOGLE, I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll walk through these, but basically in the first chapter is geared towards executive management, so strategies, KPIs of your supply chain, how are you going to correct things if, if issues come up. Chapter two looks at all your processes and procedures, making sure your people are trained properly to do the job. It also looks at risk. Then we look at, uh, chapter three looks at capacity and production planning, so how do we pr pr uh, plan production? Chapter four looks at all these, these are all requirements, all OEMs, you know, how you're gonna package your product, label it, ship it, transport it. So this looks at all the customer requirements. Chapter five looks a lot at inventory, how you manage inventory, engineering changes, and traceability. And then chapter six looks at how you manage your subsupplier. So it's looking down a level. And so if we look at some of the, uh, uh, just I wanted to give you just a quick uh, few examples. One of the key things in chapter one is those objectives or the, your KPIs. So what does that look like? This is an example of a Ford uh, per delivery performance rating. So all the suppliers have to go out to Ford and get their report card every month. So here the, the uh, supplier's target is to hit at least 90%. Uh, of it and so they're they're showing how did they do so for this is their production business and then the uh, other one is their uh, after sales so if uh, so either I produce to the production line or somebody's going into the dealership and they need a part replaced right so it's the difference between the two so at 90 percent but then what Ford wants them to do they're like don't just look at you know here we're three points off I want you to map what went wrong why you missed a point and so down here from a supply chain perspective, was there a shipping discrepancy? Uh, a cumin balance means that Ford says I should be at 1,000 pieces for the year, but I'm, only at, I'm saying I'm only at 900, so it's not balanced between the two. Did you overship? Are you behind schedule? Did you not answer when I told you you had a shortage? Um, and then um, ASN timeliness and accuracy. Uh, that's telling the OEM uh, electronically when my shipment's going to arrive. So they have to look through this and manage through that. Um, also corrective actions, what I talked about earlier with Lisa, because she did something wrong. <laughs> uh, we can go into the quality management system, and so now we can bring up, uh, what are all the things we're having problem with? So if you think about Takata when they had that airbag, because they weren't using an automated system, they had no idea that these issues were bubbling up at every single plant around the world. So if you apply technology and you can see that clearly, then you're gonna be ahead of the game. And so um, that really helps a lot in this chapter. In chapter two, again, processes and procedures are very key. Um, lots of concern about the skills gaps. Um, I've been into facilities. I think this is the worst part of supply chain. People don't wanna take the time to document what they do. But then they're not here one day and then no one can back up and now we start having problems. So very important chapter and that as well as training and also the risk assessment. Karen, why don't they, is it because of the culture or what? Why don't they want to uh, take a note? You know, I've, every, every manufacturing facility I've ever gone to just does it. I think it just takes time and people are always like, I don't have time. I think the other thing too, uh, manufacturing facilities are very lean, so people don't have a lot of extra time too. So it's like, oh, I don't have time to write that work instruction. I've gone through audits where they have to do them, like, well, when are we going to do them? And oh, we'll have to do them on the weekend because they're so busy during the day making sure that product gets out the door on time to the customer so they don't have that $27,000 minute penalty. That I think all of that just takes up a lot of time. And they're just so lean, very lean at plants. Just because they're so discreet, have you found the Japanese manufacturers good at this or not? Do you have any Japanese? Companies. I, you know, the ones that I've seen here, yes, you have Japanese. The ones that I've seen here, I think, suffer the same thing. Well, Japanese are more visual uh, in their processes, so but still writing things down, I would say it's common amongst German, Japan. It's a, just a global issue. Mm -hmm. I just think they're so, so so lean at those facilities. Just they just don't have any extra time. Hey, 
Yes. Quality processes are very lengthy. It reminds me of what we have in higher education accreditation, uh -huh. which right. in essence is, you know, assuring quality. Right. Now you mentioned next week you're going to visit a company in China mm -hmm. that is just starting. How long does this process take? If the mm -hmm. company's just starting till everything's, how long is it, years? Or? So, so from Neil's perspective, they're going to roll out MMO GLE with all, they, they're interested in doing that with their suppliers. So that'll take time. I'll probably sit with them. You know, you got to have a staff that's going to look at them. Are you going to look at all of them? Are, how are you going to audit? Are you going to audit only on problem ones? There's a lot of things you have to take into consideration. Uh, so that may take, you know, six months for them to work through how they're going to staff it. And then from a supplier perspective, to answer this, um, I've seen suppliers, they have to do it because they procrastinate so long, take up to six months to get through it. To, because you go through the assessment, now I have gaps. Now I've got to fill those gaps in. So based on your gaps, you could have another you know, five months of work to do to, to get it corrected. So it just depends on what your gaps are and how prepared you are. Yes, and you have to go back every year and make sure you're staying with those practices. You should be doing that. You could consult the, the team that's doing this as part of QAD? Yes. What, what kind of educational requirements? Like, could any of our graduates work for QAD to do this? Or um, you know, I, I learned from, um, I, I would say with, with a mentor, yes, they could learn it. I don't think there would be any issue. So a business learn. administration or an IT degree would be perfect for this course? Yep, I had IT. IT is perfect. Yes. And what's the typical pay for a job like that? Uh, for like an auditing job like that? For, um, I, so when we go to audits, companies are typically in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, you can get quite a, a I would say you can get, um, I would say anywhere, you probably could get about 2800 a day to audit. Because typically, and that's because companies wait too long, so now everything's in crisis mode. So, yeah, yes. But I, having a degree in, a, in an assembly plant, I mean not a degree, having worked in an assembly plant, any portion of it is a big jump start, is a big jump start. If you're at a, a plant for you know, a year and really started to understand how the floor worked in the front office, then, then it goes even faster. So would you suggest that e even if you want to be more of like a IT kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. programmer doing the cloud or business administration maybe, uh, kind of a management or leadership position, doing an internship in an actual plant or in a place where there's actual be An internship at a plant would be great or at any OEM in a supply chain department would be perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's a great recommendation. Internships there, absolutely, yes. What you're describing here mm -hmm. is so, uh, this foundation mm -hmm. is so transferable and applicable to any vertical. Yes, and, and any vertical, really, the best yeah, practices. Yeah, I've taken great courses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it offers the framework to a right. for success. Exactly. No matter what the product is. Exactly, exactly, exactly. A lot of my colleagues can use this exact same um, and their verticals that are maybe life sciences or something else. Terry, can you share, will you be able to share your slides with yeah. us? Oh, sure. Some of yeah. the are asking for it. Sure, yeah. sure, absolutely. So what we've like done, what we've done at QAD is we've actually mapped that process map right into QAD. So when, when new people come in, if I want to go planning, I just click on the planning and it takes me right to where I need to go. So we try, we're trying to help that skills gap and make people learn uh, much quicker. But the other thing that's really nice, if you drive down, we'd never go more than two levels deep. So here, if I was to go to the next uh, level and I needed to register a routing exception, if I click on anything with an arrow, there's the work instruction. So it tells you right out the bat what you got to do. It tells me all my compliance. So what do I need to do from a compliance perspective? It'll take me right into the area of the system. So we tr we're trying to cut that time to learn um, by providing all these tools so that everything's right there. So as people come and go, the knowledge stays in the system, so it doesn't go away. And so some of the key things here, I, we've already talked a lot about it, but here's the back flush transaction. What that is, is at the end of the day or the end of the shift, you log all the inventory, you log everything that you've produced. Uh, but these are really key OEMs. I would say this is the most important point on an audit is you're gonna have to show all your work instructions. So they have to be in really good order. 
The other just key takeaway in this chapter is the risk, and these are some of the risk plans that for sure in supply chain, you are gonna to need to show your OEM that you have thought through and you can handle those. So these are just some of the things. This is really huge right now because there's been so many disruptions. There can be a fire at an assembly plant and shuts down 30% of the automotive industry because that supplier ships to so many people globally. So that's why good contingency plans are important. And then really the tracking of risk is really in your quality management system. And, and why is it best to go there? Because every time you do something wrong, <laughs> it typically goes in your quality management system. So if I'm missing my targets, I gotta log that into quality. If I have corrective actions, I put the results um, in quality. Audits, all of this, all goes into the quality system. So now I really know where all my risk is because I'm, I'm marking down every single thing I'm doing wrong with my customers internally or with my suppliers. And then you can store all your contingency plans, you can trigger training. I was once with a materials manager and they had a fire at a plant. She had no idea where the fire alarm was. Can you imagine that? We learned when we were little kids, I can remember, I went to a Catholic uh, grade school. I remember sitting in the thing, putting your head down and you know, like, I, you know, that might've been for a tornado, but you know, I was just amazed that they had no idea where the fire alarm was. I mean, capacity and production planning, this is where it starts to get a, a lot of use in technology because again, I've got market forecasts, I've got customers telling me what they're gonna do. So really trying to plan that, look at what I really believe is gonna happen in the next five, 10 years, and then planning my downstream production. So all this again can be done automatically through tools. And then this is kind of what it looks like. You, you put in what you think is gonna happen and here's the system telling you, this is what I would do if I were you based on historically what's happened, the future forecasts, what you see here in blue is what the system will tell you, this is what I would plan. And then also um, from the system too, when you come in each day, you can take a look at what is my, what is my customer telling me to ship? And quickly we tell you if, you're un if they're way over or way under. Right, so the system tells you that immediately. So I know right away to go talk to my customer because you just increased the quantity by something I was not expecting or decreased it. Can you go back to the previous slide? I'm not mm -hmm. clear how that. Sure. Oh, oops, I go the wrong, the wrong way. Graph. Yep. So the red is what you're planning to do or is that what you're actually going to do? And then the, what is the blue? So, 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 the 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 blue line here would be your forecast from like a, from like say an IHS. There are global forecasts, and then um, the other the red line would be what your forecast would be from your OEM. So then it's pulling that together plus what you've actually really shipped historically, and then it's suggesting what you see in blue. So so it's 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 taking all the numbers so and, and red is what the OEM. The one that you're supplying is saying, I need from you. Mm -hmm. And then the blue is what you are gearing up to produce? Uh, you know what? I'm, I stand corrected. I'm looking at this again. No, I'm sorry. I did this wrong. This is your shipping information. This is your historical shipping. Okay. Then um, this is actually what your forecast and what the IHS, so external. And then the baseline is what the computer says you should do. You should, so what you should do. Or planning to underproduce? Yeah, so these forecasts are saying based on what you've done in the past and based on what we see is going on, we're saying you should go higher than what, than what you actually. It's kind of, I mean, it doesn't seem, seem and I, intuitively it seems like the blue is correct, but amazingly you're saying that the system tells you no, you actually have to gear up for this. Right, and then you can come in, when the system gives you this, you can still come back in and tweak it. Because you might say, well, the system didn't know this data point. So you still have the opportunity to move things if you need to, but it will recommend a, a, a first time for you. And then you can tweak it if you'd like to, yes. And then in the customer interface, one of the key things in automotive is shipping. So uh, here's the, this right here, you know, the windshield on your car, or the, the, the window. Next to you, this company made that. Um, and so what they're doing, this just came off the production line. So he's scanning it, the production label. And now he's getting ready to ship this off. In this case, it was Ford. Uh, it creates the label that Ford needs to have. And then once he's done, he scans all the labels and that electronically tells Ford right away what's gonna be shipped out the door in two minutes. So Ford knows exactly that this is on its way. 
And that's actually EDI, all done through EDI and barcode scanning. And then in Chapter 5, um, the other key thing, too, is, is, uh, is another thing that people use technologies. If I have a rework area, this RW102 is actually in the ERP. So I'll scan this here to say, you know, if I put 100 pieces in rework, you scan it. I know that in ERP, if I look here, it's going to say 100, and there's 100 pieces in the cage, too. So you make sure you don't lose any kind of parts. Everything's uh, consistent. And then the other exciting thing project I'm working on right now is traceability. So we're going to look at, uh, so for the young students here, or the college students, is, is with digital twin and a data lake. So how can we take, because a lot of the traceability, so knowing when a pro problem started and when it ended, it, you need to get it from different spots. So how can I take that, uh, which would be a data lake, so think of like if you Googled my name, if you Google Terry Onika, you will see videos I've done, you'll see pictures of me, you'll see articles I've written, right? So Google's giving you all, it can see any kind of format on, on what you're doing. That's kind of exactly what a data lake does. That's exactly what it's doing. So you can query across multiple different things and be able to come up with an answer. Uh, and then the digital twin, what that is, it'll be a representation of, of something physical. So. It'll be the, the digital twin will show here's all what this part has looked like from the time it was incepted to the time it was shipped. And it's a, phys it's a digital representation of kind of a physical object is what it is. So I'm really excited to be working on this. I've just started this project uh, this last week. Uh, in managing suppliers, the key thing here is electronically communicating to them. Sometimes we do come across suppliers that are too little. They can't afford to have the technology. Um, and in this case, we can actually put the, the requirements that they need to do out on the web. So they can see what they have to ship on the web. And they can also then send that advance notice to let the, the Tier 1 know it's on its way through the web as well. And they can also print the barcode label. So it provides all of that for the suppliers. Uh, risk identification is another big thing in Chapter 6. And when you think about um, all the OEMs want you to map your suppliers out globally. Why is that? Because if there's a trade war, who's all my suppliers that might be affected here? If there's a tsunami, I can quickly know who, who got impacted, right? So by mapping your supply base, you know exactly where to go look at when there's any kind of issue. Obviously, with sub-suppliers, are they financial viable? What's their future strategy? Are they ready for that electric vehicle? What's their performance? Looking at annual assessments and really taking all this information. And what we are starting to do today is take all these insights and then be able to tell the customer, hey, there's two or three things that have triggered here. You need to go look at the supplier because you've got a problem supplier. So again, using technology to find that for you versus you having to dig for it. It's interesting there is none in Russia. Oh, oh, I, this is just a, a map we pulled. It just, yeah, yes. Yeah, there's definitely suppliers in Russia, for sure. I've been there, I've seen them. And then um, also the other key thing in Chapter 6, again, now we got to show that report card down to our suppliers. we got to measure their performance and let them know how they're doing, and they can see that on the Internet as well, too. And then just to wrap up, just to show you, uh, I worked on this project, too, mm -hmm. leveraging advanced technology. So in this case, um, there's a lot of different advanced technologies out there. I just talked about digital twin. Uh, blockchain is something else I'm monitoring too. But I'm going to give you an example of machine learning. And I think everybody's familiar with machine learning. If I go into Netflix, it's going to say, Terry, you're going to want to watch this movie because I'm watching what you watch and I know what you want to see, right? We all have that experience. And that's, and that's really machine learning at play. Um, you know, keeping track of what we're doing and then predicting what Terry's going to want to watch on TV, right, or on, on Netflix. So what we did is we applied this also to the forecast process because remember I told you in the beginning, this volatile forecast is one of the biggest issues in supply chain. So what we set out to do is that the, uh, the OEM sends in this forecast to the supplier every week, okay? But, and we all know as a forecast gets closer, it's going to be really accurate, right? I'm going to know probably pretty good a week out when I'm going to want to have the supplier provide me. But five weeks out, it's, it, it, it may not be very accurate. So, but there's times when I have long lead time parts, I have no choice but in week five, I have to make a decision because I don't have the luxury of waiting this long. 
Sometimes lead times are 20 weeks, they can be 11 weeks, they can be very, very long. And so what we did is we set out to say, can we take machine learning, apply this, and be able to predict against the, uh, what the OEM uh, or the, say the General Motors or the Ford, can we predict better than them what they're gonna have to build on that day? So what we did is we took here, the blue line is what the OEM said that they were gonna want into uh, the assembly, what they were gonna want into the assembly plant, right? What the blue line is, is what they actually ship. So we, five weeks out, the OEM said they wanted this month, but on the actual day of shipment, I only produce what's on the red line. So as you can see, the OEM is always over asking <laughs> consistently for the most part. So what we did is uh, we took this data, we applied machine learning. So right here is the green line is what um, the machine learning predicted. And if you look at what was actually shipped, pretty darn close, isn't it? Very, very close. Very, very close. So when you look at the percentages, the OEM is 70% has errors, where the machine learning only had 13%. So very amazing. So we're working with this with quite a few different customers because it'll give them a better, more accurate plan. So how come the OEM, sorry, Sri, mm -hmm. how come the OEM wouldn't get, quote unquote, mad or whatnot at the, at the supplier? If they undership? If, if, the, if the OEM is saying we need 1,600 units, uh -huh. but we're only shipping you 800, is that because actually the OEM only ordered 800 units? So like, for instance, in this case, the OEM is saying they want it, on this day, the OEM said they wanted 1,800. Right. But we only shipped, what is this, about 600, a little over 600. So that really means then that the OEM, OEM is way OEM over only ordering. Really needed 600. Right, yeah. Gotcha. Yes. They estimated they needed 1,800, but really they only They were way off. Different. They were way off. So, so what we're working on now is how much safety stock, you know, just figuring out like a safety stock, you'd be much better than carrying all that excess inventory. Oh. Yes. Can you, just from your own experience, uh -huh. it looks like the OEM, they're peaking every so often. Yes. So has anyone kind of sat down and told them if you just move out your own, you know, the peaks, that actually comes closer to that, that red. No one can talk to Ford, and, you know, no one can talk to you. That is, is really, really, it's really true. I've seen these debates, you know, with the suppliers say you're always, you know, your schedule's always out of, out of you know, it's always out of whack and they're, they're not. But what the OEMs do, will do, is when I've showed this to the OEM who is the culprit here, they're like, oh my gosh, tell me more because, now you can show them data points. Now I can argue with you more. I can, I'm can. i bringing to attention, your attention, with data that you are really way out of whack. Because I'm sure they don't want, because that eventually comes back to them <laughs> in a price or something when they're way over estimating like that. Is your goal, is your, is your big sort of company vision that eventually they're, it's all automated, everything is just happening? I mean, that's really where it seems like things are going in the future with all this advanced technology, yes. And, you, and QAD then would be sort of the brain. Based on the business data, yes, to help to apply it, yes. Yes. So with that, um, just to conclude here, so just showing you that the, obviously the industry and the supply chain in general is going through major transformation. I don't care what vertical you're in, you're going through major transformation right now. Um, Maintaining a good supply chain is really key to success and really leveraging technology. I don't think if you're not in the future, you won't survive. You just won't, you won't be able to keep up with the pace of change. So with that, I want to go ahead and conclude. Yes. <laughs> yes. What advice do you have for like a supply chain student right now? Right now, um, I think technology is really good, understanding technology. Uh, I think getting somehow yourself exposed to it. I know plant life is probably not the most thrilling life, but that would be a great place to start. If you weren't there for a year or get an internship um, in some kind of aspect of supply chain, I really like, I think the plant gives you the best per perspective. I started my career out in EDI, and that's all the data coming in to help us plan and then our shipments. And just being exposed to all of that, I got such a wealth of knowledge on supply chain. 
So I think that that's really good as well, too. Yes, yes. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, you were investigating blockchain. Do you see that as playing any significant role maybe in the next five years? So there's a company you can look up uh, on the internet. They're called Mobi, M-O-B-I. And they start out looking at some things, I think, with insurance and then some uh, things I, I just more making the autonomous vehicles and things like that work. So I've been talking to them. One of the first projects they want to tackle is traceability. So how can we have every member of the tier? So, so say if I'm General Motors and you know that Takata airbag goes goes wrong, how can we quickly get down all the way to the supply chain, know exactly where it stopped and started? Because right now it's a little bit more of gas, and so then you you lose money because you may have went too broad. Obviously, there's still recalls going on. You may have went too small. So, so blockchain would be nice because every member of the tier could then post what they're doing and you might be able to much more quickly get that information than it would be today by going one tier at a time. So I see that, you know, at my, at my company, there's people that really think it's going to take other, off. Other people don't. It's kind of in between right now. I still think it's going to take off. I personally do. But I've got other people that think some of the news right now and it's not as good. So I don't really know, but it seems like it's got a lot of promise to me if we can make it work. But I think I have my email in here. So it's tjo at qad.com. So Teresa Joanne Onika, tjo. Feel free, students, connect to me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Email me, any questions, I'm here all the time. I, I love working with students and trying to help you advance through your careers. And I was here one time and I think this is a great school. I think you've got a great opportunity ahead of you. It's very exciting in supply chain. Hey, Charlie, I know you're in the room. Uh -huh. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got I have a presentation at 3:30, so for sure. <laughs> Suppose we wanted to offer a certificate in the field to the public. Uh huh. Uh, you, you may be interested in in, in having. A, this, you know, I don't know, two, three day, one week here, you give it maybe online certificate in, in, in what you discuss. Oh, sure, yeah, let me, I'd probably have to talk with AIAG. Right, right. Yeah, and they're, for you it's great because you could walk there <laughs> from here. You they're just across the street. Well, meet with yeah. Gary. Right. Ab Absolutely. That? that is a good idea. Yes. Yeah, 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 I would think they would be grateful to have any more supply chain that, all the OEMs want supply chain people right now. <laughs> so it's a good field. Thank Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.